still staying on the 14 days. We've done 14 days. We'll have another 14 days to go. Uh, we are now joined by Dr. Biodum Adedipe. Thank you very much for joining us. Is that, we, we have to start. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, we have to start from what we know to what we expect to see. So I'm going to ask, could you detail for us uh, the losses we've suffered in the past 14 days of lockdown? Well, uh, we are essentially looking at it from the economic perspective. We've had challenges relating to what the demand and supply side of our economic activity. And that is to say that demand is pent up and there is a disconnect with supply. And on the other hand also, the supply is also hampered in terms of disruption to the supply chain. So we have problems there for the entire value chain of most of the goods and services produced and provided locally. Now, what does this mean in terms of the economy? Number one is that we have concerns, what are the seven vulnerabilities, in terms of slowdown of the economy on the, on the one hand, and then an impending recession, which of course might be deep, or it might be something we can get out of quickly, depending on the access to take us out. Now, the third concern is if we go into recession, can we make a plan right now that we are going to do to ensure we treat that recovery as early as possible and then thereafter to accentuate growth? So that is where the real challenge lies. And that brings in vulnerability on different fronts. One is the production side. And that immediately also underscores the importance of SME in our economy. Now, in terms of number, SME account for about 40 percent of our GDP. So, which, if the lockdown the last 14 days affected most of it, significantly, it means that much of our GDP is at risk. And then the other side is that employment. Now. They provide 50% of the top track jobs. And SMEs also account for about 90% of manufacturing sector in terms of number. So when you put all of this together, then in context of what is happening in Africa. Now, the African Union indicated that what we are all going through now put about 20 million African jobs at risk. And if we take that on a straight line translation, that suggests about 4 million Nigerian jobs at least. A lot so of losses, them, apparently. A, a lot of losses. But uh, there's been efforts, and we know that there are palliatives. Would you say these palliatives have gone some way to mitigate the losses that you've um, un, um, highlighted? Yeah, there's uh, some problem with the way we are existing. It's a lot of programs, right? To have palliative for the most vulnerable members of society. And then the question is this to what extent are we making use of available data in dealing with it? And I will point to a few things. The first, for example, the Lagos State government has data on how many slums are in Lagos, which means there is a very good idea as to their location. And that gives you the pointer to where the most vulnerable are in Lagos, just to not change. Now, the second perspective is if there's a 14 day lockdown, the simple question would be what would the family, the household of six persons that is going by population policy, require to survive such a period of time? So, if, as we speak now, we have 2.6 million households identified to benefit from this and the president yesterday we speak, said we reach out to additional one million that is about 3.6 million families which translates into about 21.6 million people 
we by the Nigerian population for this. So the question is 21.6 million people compared to the population of the vulnerable Nigerian means we still have a long way to go. So this has to be approached in a systematic manner. What are the basic statements that Nigerians consume? So when you design the package of that week, you must take that into account. Then the second is where are they? And of course, the third is related to the conditional cash transfer. And it is uh, you know quite encouraging that the minister you know mentioned yesterday that four of our states are already on the list. Okay, so what that means in essence is that the conditional cash transfer can only be effective if we use the data available, which is the bankable Nigeria in the first instance. So if these people are on the digital platform, then the transfers can be done to them directly to their bank account instead of carrying cash all around. So, and of course, that avoids a lot of abuse, diversions, and the rest of it. All right, um, we're pressed for time, so I, I would have to interject and ask you about a particular uh, segment of the society. The government talked about the vulnerable, uh, poor households. What about those in slums, those that may not have any formal record with the government, but we know loads of them exist? What do you think, what strategy do you think that the government should have to address and address the issue concerning these people's welfare? Yeah, that's the point I made in fact. Using Lagos State as an example, that the government knows where the slums are. So there are two things to combine there. What I said about what the package of policies contain, in terms of basic people like rice, gary, beef, yam, and steak, that's on the one hand. Then two is that we know where the slums are. So these palliatives should be taken to those locations. Rather than simply say, okay, let's go to a local government headquarters um, or possibly just go to any street that we see around and start to distribute bread, loaves of bread, and whatever. If government knows where the slums are, at least the government knows, that is where the palliatives should be taken to. And that will have immediate effect in terms of the government and care. But that goes a long way in terms of avoiding prejudication. Okay, sorry for something. All right, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us on the news. My pleasure.